Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the resurrection of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be contradicted. At Christmas, we heard this profound saying from the fathers of the church. God became man so that man might become God. God became man so that man might become God. Not that we literally become God, that would be an error, but that we can enter into the one act of God's love in heaven. We know the devil, he offered Eve what appeared to be a quick and easy solution to this very thing. If she would only eat of the forbidden fruit, she would be as God. She'd become a God. Instead of waiting for God to become man, instead of waiting for Christmas, instead of waiting to be given all the graces needed for reaching heaven so that she could enter into the one eternal act of God's love, she reached out and ate the fruit. It was a lie, and we know all too well that it didn't work. For she lost the likeness of God she possessed. That is, she lost her sanctifying grace. To be like God then, to become one with Him in heaven, to enter into the one act of God's love of Himself, we cannot bypass Christmas. We cannot bypass the incarnation of the King. God became man so that we might become God. This means the path, the truth incarnate chose to undo the lie of Satan and the sin of Adam and Eve. The path he chose to return to heaven, to return to God his Father, is the same path we too must take. Many saints and spiritual writers have called this path, this road, the way of spiritual childhood. Why is that? Because God's Almighty Word leaped down from heaven, the introit said. God's Almighty Word leaped down from heaven, from the royal throne, and first appeared to us as a little child. His journey back to the Father started in a visible way on Christmas Day. Little child. Thus the prophet Isaiah speaks of how a little child shall guide them. A little child shall lead them. The apocalypse speaks of how the saints in heaven, now gods as it were, followed the Lamb whithersoever He went. Whithersoever He go. This too is our path. So what kind of road is this? Well, among other things, it's one of faith, humility, voluntary poverty, detachment, purity, innocence. Those are things we see whenever we look at a crib. Although such virtues seem hard and difficult and even scary at first, requiring abandonment, darkness of faith, self-denial, we should take heart because the angel said to the shepherd, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The infant is there in swaddling clothes. That means he's wrapped up like a mummy. He's not going anywhere. The Blessed Virgin Mary is there and St. Joseph is there too. They will help us. But let's face facts. We do not readily follow the way of the Lamb. The way of spiritual childhood. We do not easily pass into the night of faith. We want more things, huh? Rather than less. We want to fill our senses with the delights of this world rather than to put them to sleep and go into the night. We think along different lines than those provided by the infant. Today, more than ever before, 
We make God submit to us. We make God submit to our reason, to our way of thinking, to our ideas, to our political systems, and to our sciences. I think, therefore I am, exclaimed Descartes. If we cannot think of it or know about it according to our way of thinking, we are not going to submit to it. This translates into, we will make ourselves God without God made man. Without His church. Without Christmas. This is the original sin all over again. Now it seems to me that the great Russian writer Dashayevsky captured the heart of this problem very well in one single statement. He places on the tongue of the holy monk Father Zosima. You can read about it in his magnum opus, The Brothers Karamazov. Father Zosima said, Active love is a harsh and fearful thing as compared to love in dreams. Active love is a harsh and fearful thing as compared to love in dreams. So there is active love and love in dreams. Love in dreams that feeds the lie that Adam and Eve embraced. You will be like God now. Active love is, on the other hand, the way of the Lamb. The way of God. It's the way out of this world of lies. Now let's consider a few examples. In regard to Christmas... We can dream, right? We can dream of our Lord coming to earth and being welcomed at least by many, many loving people. How he would be born in pillared halls. It's only fitting. Placed in a crib made for a king in a warm room with many adorers and much fanfare. How there would be an army of loyal servants and soldiers at his beck and call. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. What of voluntary poverty? What of detachment and humility? What happened to those? Love and dreams dictates how when he would grow up, he would gloriously conquer the world with his army of angels and men for God his Father. How the whole world would be united and made a holy ground. No more errors, no more lies, no more falsehoods, no more heresies, no more claws of Satan tearing at the mystical body of Christ, His church. No more hunger, no more disease and disasters. Love and dreams, love and dreams. Once immediate action, quickly performed, and everybody watching and applauding. No long suffering, no patience in trial, no signs of contradiction. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What of the need for faith? What happened to that? Self denial. Perseverance, merit. What of innocence and purity of body and heart? Ah, love and dreams, huh? These ideals will only come to pass in the second coming, not the first. That comes after the birth from the virginal tomb, not after the birth from the virginal womb. And they will come about in a way that our poor little pea brains cannot fathom. In ways that are so wonderful that they will be forever a marvel. But in the meantime, the devil loves the idealist who impatiently refuse the first. That is, they reject Christmas in some way or other. And try to make things happen according to their own formulations of their own ideas and dreams. So the devil has little trouble selling these people all kinds of lies. These enthusiasts 
are what kept the various heresies and communist revolutions alive, fueled and running for decades and are still moving and running to wipe out billions of men and destroy the faith in whole countries. This continues to this day in a multitude of movements around the world and not just communistic ones. Love and dreams. That's what it is. Love and dreams. Now love and action, however, well, it's a terrible, a harsh and fearful thing. Terrible and fearful to our poor human little ways of thinking and acting. But as the angel said, we should not be afraid. Because active love is from God. It humbles itself. It empties itself. It hides itself. God comes down to earth. He hugs the earth in the incarnation. He kisses the earth, as it were, by taking on our human flesh and even watering the earth with his tears and his blood. Active love is seemingly defenseless, helpless, vulnerable, humble, detached, poor. Active love binds itself for us men and for our salvation. First in the womb of the virgin, he was bound. Then in swaddling clothes, he's wrapped up like a mummy. Then on the wood of the cross, and finally in the Eucharist, he is locked away in our tabernacles. Active love is born in a smelly cave that does not belong to it, a mist beast of burden and cold of winter's night. Active love has an army, a small band of disciples who swear they will die with him no matter what but end up running away or denying him three times or even selling him for 30 pieces of silver. That's active love. Active love is a harsh and fearful thing. And this is the way of the Lamb. It's the way to Calvary. It's the way to complete freedom. It's the way to heaven. Now, if we persevere and labor down this pathway of spiritual childhood, at times all will seem lost. But then amazingly and unexpectedly, all works out according to our faith. So in the powerlessness of the infant, in the manger, grace flows. Faith is what is needed. Now, surely some here have experienced what I'm speaking of. Something of this truth. Now for us priests, I'll give some examples. <laughs> we dream of preaching ideal sermons, right? Just the right length. To the point. Clear. But we end up stumbling along. We dream that our holy masses will be filled with faithful souls. But few come, right? All these empty pews. We dream. We dream that people will love the Holy Mass, but they end up leaving early. We dream of people going to frequent confession, but they put it off for years, months, years. We dream of people always receiving Holy Communion in a state of grace. But many come to the altar rail without a clear conscience. Active love is a harsh and fearful thing as compared to love and dreams. Now for religious, they dream of the ideal community with perfect observance, kind superiors, but they end up entering Noah's Ark with all its smells, wild animals, and its confinement. For parents, for parents, they dream of raising perfect children, intelligent, obedient, holy, virtuous, supportive. But many end up going astray in some way or other. For young people, they dream of that ideal marriage. 
that things will be different for them than for all those other people they see. That all will work out just right for us. And, but then they get married and have to embrace active love or run away. Active love is a terrible and fearful thing as compared to love and dreams. Here then is the lesson. When we think we know the right answer, when we think we have the solution, when we think we know better, then we're most likely, what? In the realm of dreams. When we think we know, chances are you're in the realm of dreams. Are we dreaming of the ideal religious life, the ideal marriage, ideal husband, ideal wife, ideal children, ideal pope, ideal bishop, ideal diocese, ideal parish, ideal priest, ideal president, ideal country? Oh, how easy it is to project our ideals upon these people and things in an effort to make them fit what we want them to be, thereby carving out a psychological and emotional pit into which we fall when the reality finally hits us. How many people are digging these pits every single day? Many in Israel fell into this pit because the infant king did not fit their ideals. And those same people are fighting the church to this very day, hating Christmas, outlawing it at any chance they get. If we want to rise with Him, we should immediately recognize that this sort of thinking, this dreamy love, does not follow from the way of the Lamb, who Himself passed through the great tribulation as a sign of contradiction. We too must go this way. When we feel these dreamy ideals rise up in us, come upon us, we should immediately humble ourselves. We should hug and kiss the earth, watering it with our tears, recognizing that we are very little and stop thinking that we know so much about such great matters and abandon ourselves to God, the King who is in charge. God became man so that we might become God. This is the way He chose to go and we must follow on this path. On this path, we keep watch with the truth and conquer the lie of Satan. On this path, we will avoid contempt both of ourselves and of others. On this path, we will avoid fear, which is simply the consequence of some lie, the consequence of falling into that pit we dug for ourselves. On this path, not even our own faint-heartedness and sinfulness, nor those of others, will frighten or shock us for they will just show us how little we really are and how little we really know and how much we really need the help of the infant king. Now it seems to me that this message I've given you today is summed up perfectly in a poem written by the Carmelite martyr of Compiègne, Blessed Teresa of St. Augustine. She and her 15 Carmelite companions brought an end to the French Revolution's darkest hour, the Reign of Terror. On July 17th, 1794, they died. Ten days later, the length of a novena, it ended. They offered themselves in sacrifice. Listen carefully to these incredible, profound words. O oh, infant God, naught else can fill my longing. Yes, nothing else can satisfy my heart. It is settled then, henceforth I'm thy belonging, and of thy love I now become a part. God became man so that man might become God, so that we might enter into the one act of love that is God. That's what she's saying. I now have your love. I'm a part of it. My criminal soul... Heal of its sins so shameful. Wound thou my heart with pain or love's delight. I'm not afraid of Calvary. Give me my cross. 
way of the Lamb. Let wounds divine, wounds for my soul so grateful, martyr my heart to suffer day and night. O love divine, I now with all my being, here at thy crib, abandoned all my soul. I thus yield up my reasoning and my seeing. No more of this I think, therefore I am nonsense. I abandon myself to the king. From this time forth my faith in thee is bold. Thy heart alone, thy heart shall be my master. Thoughts and desires I sacrifice as weak. I'm not going to make God submit to me. I'm going to submit to him. Within thy heart I would now be seized faster. The martyrdom of love alone I seek. Sweet Savior God, fix my hope. Oh, fix it all on dying. Truly I die from not dying for Thee. And hasten, Lord, the end of all my sighing. Freed from these chains, to Thee alone I flee. Let Thy blade cut. completing all my offerings, for nothing but thy will for me is sweet. My one desire is that thy hand be hovering over thy bride, me thy bride. The sacrifice complete. Active love is a harsh and fearful thing as compared to love and dreams. Active love is the way the child Jesus has chosen to go. And where he goes, we must follow if we are to become God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.